Good morning. Um, this is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and it is Wednesday, March 17th. And this morning's um, first half of this morning's meeting, um, we are uh, talking with uh, um, uh, uh, alcohol um, and substance use disorder, the arm of the Vermont Department of Health, as they share with us um, their um, request for information as it relates to um, redesigning um, their proposal, which we're now just hearing about, uh, their uh, proposal to redesign um, service delivery. And that will be the first part of our morning. We're also gonna hear some testimony um, from uh, providers. Uh, welcome everyone and um, welcome, uh, Kelly and Cynthia, and I'm not sure how the two of you um, want to do this. Is this, do you, do you both want to be, um, I'll leave it to you. Okay. Um, um, I do know that given us a um, very, there is a um, PowerPoint on, um, or slides on our committee webpage um, that I guess you're going to share some of us, some of it with us. And I, We've had a back and forth that you wanted to let us know what is current and that's appreciative, but we have lots of testimony. So mm -hmm. that's brief because yeah. what we want to know is so we can give you input as to our reactions to your, what you are hoping to do with do. Okay, thank you. Great. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kelly Dougherty and I'm Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. And one of the areas that I work with is ADAP. And I think that, um, correct, I, I did put together pretty comprehensive slides, just recognizing that I know that there are some new members on the committee who may not be as familiar with the ADAP system of care. I'm not gonna go through all of those slides comprehensively, but a lot of them were just there for your reference. But I think just sort of level set, level setting sort of what the system is now um, would be good groundwork for talking about uh, the system redesign. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And can you all see that? Yep, okay. And I just need to, I'm gonna stop my video for a minute and I'm gonna pause my sharing because I need to get it to the presenter view. So bear with me for one moment. Um, Having a technical issue, bear with me for a second. Sorry. That's okay, we all have them. <laughs> okay, here we go, can you still hear me? I can't see you all now that I'm sharing, now that I'm, uh, now that I'm doing this, so. Um, if you, um, you may be doing it, but we don't see it. Yep, here we go. All right, now are you seeing it? Now we see it. Great, okay. So like I said, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of um, the Division of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs at the Department of Health. Um, you can see, um, I won't read this for you, but our, our mission and principles basically to prevent and eliminate the problems caused by substance misuse. So um, we work with a wide variety of organizations and we recognize that substance use disorder is a brain disease and requires a public health approach. And um, uh, I'll leave that there for now. This is just a, the structure of our work. So, you know, the division is a um, part of the Department of Health. It wasn't always that way. Um, years ago, it used to be its own entity, but we are now um, recognizing that this requires a public health approach. ADAP is part of the health department. 
Um, you can see our structure here. We have um, a budget of about 55 million in the ADAP division alone, and we give out over 300 grants a year to various community partners across the state. So we have a pretty broad and deep infrastructure with a lot of expertise in the science of prevention, treatment and recovery. And um, in addition to this, well, it's mentioned here, we have prevention consultants in all 12 um, AHS districts across the state. So we have uh, local boots on the ground um, through our health department district offices uh, doing the work of prevention in communities and working with partners. I'm not gonna read this to you, but this is just sort of um, the various categories of work that we do. Um, we fund, which we're gonna be talking about a lot, the treatment system, prevention, intervention services, recovery. We work with partners on enforcement and regulation, and we look at policy and procedure development um, and do a lot of professional development and education for substance use professionals in the field. This I just wanted to illustrate just sort of that this work doesn't happen in a silo with ADAP. We actually partner with um, other departments within the Agency of Human Services, as well as other state departments and agencies. So it really is um, a, a comprehensive system that, um, that we work within and partner a lot with our fellow state um, government partners. Just for some context, you may already know this, but alcohol is the most commonly used substance by Vermonters age 12 plus. Um, and actually our numbers in Vermont are not that great. Um, and you can see uh, alcohol, we've got tobacco past month, which has steadily declined over the years, and marijuana, which we're seeing creep back up, which is a concern. Fewer than 5% compared to the 60% of alcohol, fewer than 5% of Vermonters used cocaine or opioids in the last year. So for very good reasons, we talk a lot about the opioid crisis and um, uh, you know, it is something that needs to be addressed and continued to be focused on, but I just wanted to give you this context that um, it really is a minority of the substances that we are, um, that folks are using. This just illustrates sort of the, uh, the full spectrum of work that ADAP does in collaboration with its community partners and providers. We do a lot of health promotion and prevention, and again, intervention, treatment, and recovery. A little bit about our prevention work. Um, so we work to change people's knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs uh, that impact substance use. And one of the takeaways for this slide is that um, if you take nothing else away, is that there is no one strategy approach for all individuals or communities when it comes to prevention. We really need to take a very community-centric ap approach because what would work in one community may not work in another and each community has its own sort of assets and resources to work with. So uh, we can't really have a, a blanket approach to prevention. Um, and prevention programs um, can save a lot of money as well as um, a lot of health consequences of substance use. This is our Vermont prevention model, which you may have seen, which is basically the socio-ecological model where whenever you're talking about prevention, it's really important to work across all levels of this model because just focusing on individual behaviors or individual knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs is not gonna change the culture that supports um, substance use. So an example I always like to give is in the tobacco world. Um, years ago, we made it uh, uh, unacceptable and illegal to use tobacco in public places. So we worked at the organization level and the community level, and then we worked at the policy level to increase taxes and do other things that actually help to drive our tobacco uh, rates down, tobacco use rates. This is basically the uh, SAMHSA uh, PDSA cycle uh, that they use for um, uh, 
for development of prevention programming. So we use this in our work um, and it comes from SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And I apologize, my cat is knocking things off my desk while I talk to you. Um, so we have, like I mentioned, our prevention consultants that are in all of our district offices that work in their communities. Um, that we also do some work with school um, based prevention grantees. This is at the supervisory union level and not even all schools in the supervisory unions that we fund participate. Um, and you can see there's a lot of gap here. And you know the, the reason is, is that this is uh, grant funded, largely federal. We've seen a decrease and um, it's not really secure funding from year to year. Um, and then this is our regional prevention partnership grantees. And we used to have seven, um, uh, but uh, our funding went down um, from 2 million to 1 million. So we've been, a, we haven't been able to fund as many prevention partnership grants as we had in the past. And these are just some of our prevention campaigns. We do a lot of messaging, as I'm sure you're aware at the health department. Um, the, a lot of these are very targeted messaging. So these ones on the right. So you may not have ever encountered these messages because you're not the target audience. So they are very targeted toward people in specific populations. So um, a lot of digital campaigning that um, will target people who may be at greatest risk. And then, as I'm sure you're aware, we have the uh, fairly new Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council that was formed in 2019. Um, it started meeting in October of 2019 and has really um, replaced the Opioid Coordination Council. It replaced the Vermont Alcohol and Drug Abuse Council and it replaced the, uh, the Tobacco Evaluation Review Board to really have a consolidated focus on prevention that was not substance specific. So, um, so this council pro provides advice to, uh, to you all and to the administration on policies and programming um, to ensure that prevention is included in policy. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. So another focus of our work is intervention and harm reduction. So this is sort of like secondary prevention. You know, we talked about primary prevention in the last section. These are um, services and programs that help people who uh, may be struggling with substance use um, and, uh, you know, can help lower their risk um, or intervene to, you know, maybe uh, decrease substance use. So one you might be familiar with is IDRP. It used to be called Project CRASH. Um, this is the Impaired Driver Rehabilitation Program that ADAP has run for years, although we, now we have a, a newer curriculum. And this is something that we um, expect to have an increased focus on with the marijuana, recreational marijuana um, market coming um, and, you know, sort of preventing and intervening in um, impaired driving. These are some of our intervention services across the state and harm reduction services. We work with our syringe services programs across the state. There are a lot of alliances that have, um, some of them really sprung into action as a result of the opioid crisis, but have continued to work in their communities and broaden their scope. Um, and these are some of our uh, messaging and uh, materials around um, harm reduction and reducing stigma. So really trying to get the word out about naloxone, um, you know, some safety messages um, and, uh, and our Vermont Help Link, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment. This is a an, an really exciting process progress project, the rapid access to MAT. So um, this is now um, in every county. It started in Washington County. And what it does is it connects people, um, connects these systems to enable us to provide MAT to people much more quickly than um, had been in the past. 
So some emergency departments, when people come in and are um, either come in because of an overdose or come in and um, you know disclose that they are um, using opioids, uh, some hospitals can induct them onto buprenorphine right then and there, and then make the connection to their local hub to continue services. Um, some emergency departments work directly with their local hubs to get medication to people quickly. So um, our goal is really, we say three days or less, our goal is 24 hours. And, and in many cases that can happen from first point of contact to first medication dose. Um, really making those connections so that we can break down barriers, connecting people to recovery supports in the emergency department as well is a big piece of that um, to, to start building up somebody's support system. And then Vermont HealthLink was launched almost a year ago, right around this time last year, um, which is a uh, support center. It's a phone number and a website where people can get information, resources, and get connected to services related to substance use. You can see we launched in March of, two, of 2020. We saw a little spike in April, May. Um, this is the phone calls. And then these are our website visits, which have really skyrocketed. We know that um, people are struggling right now with COVID um, and substance use. And again, alcohol is the primary substance of concern for people contacting Vermont Health Link. And uh, we also partnered with DMH to, um, we're getting uh, mental health resources available through Vermont Health Link for um, people who work in healthcare, recognizing that uh, those folks have really been, um, had a lot of challenges over this last year with COVID. Finally, treatment. I think this is where, you know, folks are most probably interested right now. So um, ADAP has uh, a, a preferred provider treatment system that has 25 providers and over 30 locations statewide. Um, and this is just sort of a snapshot of what's there. Um, these are our preferred providers. So this is our preferred provider network. So we have all kinds of providers. We have uh, nonprofits and for-profits. They're all paid the same through ADAP and held to the same standards. So we certify these providers. Um, there are certain treatment standards they have to meet. And, um, and as distinguished from DMH, um, like we have a wider array of providers. So we don't, um, in the ADAP world, you can see that most of our providers are not designated agencies. And we have eight designated agencies that are part of our network. <clears throat> and um, one thing of note with the substance use treatment system is that there are no catchment areas. So unlike DMH, so as a consumer, I can go anywhere um, to get substance use care. I don't have to go to the provider that's closest to me. Um, I can see anyone that I want um, in the system. And these providers, because they're um, certified by ADAP and they are um, held to our treatment standards, we have an enhanced Medicaid reimbursement rate that, they, um, that they're eligible for. So obviously this isn't all of the substance use services available in Vermont. Um, there are um, private practitioners and those kinds of things, but this is our ADAP network. So this is just a little bit about our certification rule and um, sort of what that process looks like. Um, and most people, um, there are many people who don't seek treatment um, for substance use disorder, mostly because they don't feel like they need it. So I wanted to highlight this just because it's more than just making services available in the community. We have to do a lot of work to um, sort of highlight uh, the benefits of treatment, that treatment is effective and it works um, because we, uh, so it's more than just making sure the services are in communities. We really need to promote them and, um, and encourage people to seek treatment if they need it. Um, so the preferred provider system has become 
obviously, again, for good reason, very focused on opioid use disorder. So most people seeking treatment, even though we know alcohol is a much bigger problem um, in terms of the number of people who use it, most people um, who enter treatment are seeking it for um, heroin, heroin or other opioid, um, other opioids. And then this just illustrates the growth in our um, hub and spoke system. So it's grown every year since uh, 2012. Um, and you know, we're serving more and more people. And uh, with COVID, um, treatment providers really turned to telemedicine and telephone for outpatient services. So you can see um, last year in January and February, it was 0% um, of non-hub services provided to Medicaid through telemedicine and it just shot up with COVID, which is great that they were able to transition to make those services available. And then very quickly, recovery. So we work with the 12 recovery centers across the state. We provide them with financial support and technical support. Um, and they're all independent. Uh, they're their own independent um, 501c3 organizations. So, but there is a recovery network that, you know, helps provide support to, um, to these organizations. So we work closely with them. And these are just some of the services that are available at recovery centers. Um, a wide array of services uh, that are available. And um, you can see in 2020, again, lots of remote recovery services, which can be really challenging for people because it's all about that personal connection. But the recovery centers were able to pretty quickly with COVID, um, uh, switch to remote services. So here's where we're going to talk about the system of care redesign. That's one of our new initiatives. Um, some other things that we've been working on is uh, co-locating MAT and syringe service programs. So you're, I'm sure you're aware of um, uh, the Howard Center's program, Safe Recovery in, uh, in Burlington where they are a syringe service program, but they also have a prescriber um, so they can connect people right then and there with treatment. We are working with other syringe services providers in the state to be able to offer that same model um, in other places. We are actively uh, working on overdose prevention and harm reduction campaigns, um, particularly in light of increased overdoses during COVID. We've been giving out uh, specialty community action grants to address um, overdose prevention, and we continue our workforce development work. So here's where I think everybody has the most interest. I hope that I hope that you could understand me. I feel like I'm talking really quickly, but I wanted to just lay that groundwork. Does anyone have any questions before I move into the uh, system of care redesign section? Okay. Um, my question when you go through your slides is to start with the why. What, yeah. is, the, what, is, what is the purpose of the RFI? Um, and who, who did you get input from in terms of the system of care redesign? And where was legislative direction? Yeah, so um, you, Madam Chair, have read my mind because my first slide is why are we doing this? So, um, so the, the, um, the system of care redesign, there were a couple of different um, avenues through which this became um, something that we wanted to pursue. One is that really the system of care for substance use, other than the addition of hubs, you know, um, the hub and spoke system uh, for opioids, there really hasn't been any change in the delivery of care over the last 30 years. Um, and there's inconsistent access across the state and inconsistent quality of care across the state. And there's also workforce instability. So it's really hard for providers to um, recruit and retain staff. 
So some of this work um, started under the Opioid Coordination Council. There was a lot of work done through the OCC where they examined the system of care, uh, talked with stakeholders and identified sort of what the strengths of our current system was, where the gaps were, um, especially uh, with respect to transitions of care. Um, we often lose people when they move from, you know, one level of care to another. And it was identified that there really needed to be a stronger uh, coordination of care for people in SUD treatment. Uh, some folks have multiple case managers. Uh, the system is not necessarily easy to navigate. Um, people weren't, we heard loud and clear that people didn't know when it, when they wanted to seek treatment for themselves or a loved one, they weren't even, they didn't know where to go. Um, and it's not an easy system to navigate. And again, it was set up many years ago, pre-opioid crisis. Um, and the hub and spoke system, despite its uh, success, um, has really fragmented the system in some way. Um, so, you know, we've got that system sort of overlaid over this other system. So, um, so we really wanna focus on um, better coordination of care, better transition of care. So the goals of this uh, effort, um, this is where we'd like to end. We don't know how we're gonna get there yet. That's the purpose of the RFI. Um, but we want all Vermonters to have equal access to a core set of evidence-based services. We want one treatment system that is agnostic of substance. So in other words, you know, we have the whole hub and spoke system that is really focused on opioids, but there isn't really a system um, that's designed to cover all substances. Again, enhanced care coordination to include the physical health care system, co-occurring disorders and recovery services, and a seamless system that's easy to access and navigate and includes all of the the different areas. So the intervention, co-occurring, recovery, care management, and eventually um, a value-based payment structure to incentivize a higher quality of care and outcomes for Vermonters. So we already um, uh, are in a value-based payment structure in our hubs and in our residential programs, um, but not for our outpatient programs. So, um, and we don't have, you know, when we think about these goals, um, we don't currently have the infrastructure to make this happen. Some programs are very small with very small staff. And, you know, one thing that I want to just make really clear is through this process, we have no intention of destabilizing the, the DA system. So we, you know, want to work within um, our existing resources um, and just provide a better system for Vermonters to access um, substance use services. Um, here are some more goals. Um, we really need to reduce the duplicative effort on behalf of the client. So sometimes clients are going to multiple providers, getting multiple assessments, depending on whether they're, they might have, um, uh, they might be getting opioid treatment, they might be getting some other treatment for another substance, they might be, um, have mental health, issues. Um, so really making that more efficient. Uh, recruiting and, re and retention of high quality staff, including competitive wages and benefits, which I think that all of our providers would agree is a challenge. And um, a reduction in administrative functions. So these are all the things that are in scope for this redesign. So we want to take all of these services and really um, make them more coordinated. And these are the things that are um, in focus in the RFI. I don't know if you had a chance to read the document. I did put a link in the presentation. Um, one thing we're not including in this right now is prevention. And the reason for that is that we have, like I mentioned earlier, the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council, 
and we, you know, that council is very active in doing its work and we don't want to get out ahead of that council since it is the designated body that is um, supposed to advise the state on prevention services. So we've been working very closely with the Agency of Human Services Central Office, including Blueprint, which has moved from DIVA to AHS Central Office. Um, the spokes are part of the Blueprint system of care, so we work closely with Blueprint on that. Um, but we've been meeting with the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary around this um, idea of the system redesign for a, a long while now. Um, we're working with the Department of Vermont Health Access um, to, uh, we've been working with them, their payment reform team, although I want to emphasize that um, right now we're not talking about payment reform. Right now we're talking about the system, the delivery system. And we've been meeting regularly as well with the Department of Mental Health. Um, so all, we're, we are working closely with our state partners. We can't do this in a silo. Um, and we are very aware of that. And these are some of the stakeholders. So ADAP staff actually conducted interviews with a lot of our stakeholders um, around to sort of get the low hanging fruit around what did they see as the strengths um, and challenges in our current system. So these interviews were um, conducted between September and February. And, um, but I wanna stress that this was not the only opportunity for these entities to provide input. That was just sort of the preliminary sort of conversation, like what off the, you know, off the top of your head is, uh, do you see as uh, our strengths and challenges? So I have a link here to the RFI. It was posted on um, the 26th and responses are due on April 29th. Um, basically, how this process worked is those interviews that I just talked about, um, in addition to the work of the OCC, there was a lot of information gathered and we heard many themes in that, um, through that feedback. Um, again, around coordination of care, um, assist, needing a system that's easy to get in and navigate, that's person-centered, where people can, you know, go to one place. Um, so what we did was we created the RFI based on those themes that we heard. So this didn't come just, you know, from ADAP's head. It um, really came from the stakeholders themselves. We did um, Excuse send... me. I'm sorry. Excuse mm -hmm. me. We have a question from Representative Wood. And yes. I just noticed it, and it was probably from something earlier that you had said. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just, you know, so actually, it's been it was very helpful for you to kind of go over the current system um, briefly. And the the way I'm hearing you describe it, it sounds like um, sort of a a patchwork quilt of all these things that knit together to form a system, and. Um, as you're looking forward, are, are you looking to, I'm familiar with in, in some parts of the Agency of Human Services, there's a, a system where there's you know, a particular catchment area and if, if you're a person who has a need for that covered area, so in this case it would be substance use services, um, you would go to that one place and then they would either provide or arrange for the provision of of other services for you, you know, whether through contracts with other agencies or uh, direct referrals. Are, are you envisioning something like that? Or is, is that kind of really the purpose of this RFI? So the purpose of this RFI, I wanna really stress that we do not have a preconceived idea of what the system is gonna look like. So the purpose of the RFI is for information gathering only. So we're inviting, um, we're inviting respondees to share ideas on what a system could look like. So um, there's no commitment. You know, we're, we're not committed to any other than our goals, which I stated earlier. We're not committed to the system looking a particular way per se. Um, what we really want is to generate ideas and to hear from um, 
from our current providers and others what a, a system that meets those goals could look like. So, and I also wanna let folks know that if somebody doesn't respond to the RFI, um, that doesn't mean that if we eventually put out an RFP that they can't respond, like responding to the RFI is not required. It's, it's like an invitation. And so um, it, um, so what I'm gathering then um, that, that you, that the department had a hypothesis <laughs> that there, there needed to be some change and you went out and you did all this, you know, all these interviews and information gathering and the, the result of that, um, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but this is sort of what I'm hearing, taking away from what you're saying. Um, the result of all of that information gathering from, um, uh, from people who utilize the system, from people who have been providers in the system, from uh, advocates, all of that. The result of that was that, that feedback was that there needed to be some changes and you know the goals that you outlined previously um, sort of being the, the groundwork for that. So I guess what I'm wanting to confirm is that what you heard from all of those people that you talked with is that there needed to be change. Is, is that accurate? Yes, I would say that's accurate. And I'm gonna see if Cindy wants to add anything because she actually conducted some of those interviews herself. Am I on? Yes, you are. Kelly. Yeah. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all for inviting us to do this because this is such important work and having the opportunity to um, um, do this presentation is really important. So yeah, I did do a number of the interviews, um, mostly with the, the uh, recovery centers and the treatment providers. And um, there were very clear themes on the areas that needed to be changed. People were pretty excited about the opportunity to make these changes. And like Kelly said, the themes really revolved around person-centered care, easy access, having the services coordinated, Workforce development was is always um, identified as an area we need to work on, retaining staff, being able to pay staff well. Um, a question, and it may be that people are misreading the RFI, um, but it appears to many people who have uh, connected with me that what the department is looking for is to outsource um, the responsibility for um, the system. That in fact, you are looking for someone, an entity outside of state government to be um, uh, the coordinator, to be um, the linchpin or to be responsible. So Madam Chair, that um, is a, a misunderstanding in the RFI. So that is certainly um, an option. What we did with the RFI was we um, definitely put some categories in there, but it's not, that is, again, I just wanna reiterate that we have no specific model that has been predetermined. Cindy, do you wanna speak to that in the RFI? Just to confirm what you said, Kelly, is that uh, different, I, like during those interviews, um, many people had different ideas of how the system could work and be coordinated. Um, an example of that would be um, we had uh, one entity describe how cancer treatment is provided and that there is a team, an identified team. And so when an individual needs treatment, they are assigned to a team and that team are the only group of people that they see and they all work together very, very closely. It's very coordinated and they get all their care with the same people all the time. Um, someone else talked about expanding the model of the hub and spoke. So we have the, the hub and then it's the intensive coordinating treatment with the, and then the spokes that people can um, move into for lesser levels of care when they're more stable. So there's different models like that that people suggested. So the purpose of the RFI, the way it was written is to have people respond to different ideas like that. 
to see if people have done it before and how did it work? Because we don't know, we don't have the answers to this. So that's the purpose of the RFI is to generate more detailed ideas and thinking than we did in those initial interviews. The very, and they were, the, they were not long um, and they were just the beginning of this process. Yeah. And we did um, send the draft RFI before it went out, out to all of the stakeholders so that they could provide feedback um, on the RFI before it was released. So there was opportunity for our current providers to give input on the RFI and we did make some changes in response to that. That's helpful that you did that. It's unfortunate that you do not see the legislature as a partner and that in fact, you do, we were not part of the stakeholder group. Okay. So um, this is sort of our current work plan and timeline. So um, we started this internal planning last January. Um, and again, we did our interviews. The RFI was actually posted a little bit earlier than this. It was posted on the, the 26th of February. And again, responses are due April 29th. And our vision is that whatever the new service delivery system looks like, that it would begin in January of 2023. Um, so uh, we'll follow the same process as in the past. Um, so uh, pro, you know, providers can, um, you know, will be engaged in the process. Often what we've done when we've done big initiatives is our provider network will um, identify representatives to um, bring information back to the larger group. Um, uh, we'll have reps from all types and levels of care. So from, you know, residential and outpatient, um, you know, recovery centers. Um, and if we do decide to put out an RFP for this work, we're gonna coordinate closely with our uh, legal folks because there'll come a point when, um, when anyone who's potentially going to apply or submit a proposal to the RFP, you know, would have to sort of not be getting sort of inside information. I don't know a better way to say that, but um, so we'll be working closely with our legal folks on that. And that is the end of my slides. So I'm looking forward to um, a conversation or answering additional questions. You're muted, Madam Chair. You'd think I'd learn. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, um, a series of questions, um, one from Representative Small and um, one from uh, Representative Whitman. Representative Small. Um, going back to the last slide that you were showing, it says that the RFI responses are due by 4-29-20. Oh. Um, I assume <laughs> incorrect. I'm wondering what the actual date is. For I'm her. sorry. It's 4 21 I apologize for that. Thank you. I just can't seem to let 2020 go. Representative Whitman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Deputy Commissioner Dorchi, um, for the presentation, the overview, all of the work that you're doing. Um, really appreciate it. Um, couple questions that I have, since now I guess it is our turn to be the, the focus group, um, is looking at, um, so say an RFP, goes out because I understand from reading the RFI, one of the options you're considering is a vendor to be the service delivery coordinator, which would be um, a significant change. I guess um, two parts to my question is um, similar to the way that we have the uh, prevention advisory council within state government. Um, would it be possible for us to uh, do treatment and recovery, that same kind of work in these kinds of changes within the state. 
Um, and my second question is if we do go with an RFP for a vendor, um, would our current ACO um, be able to put in an RFP for this scope of work? I'm sorry, the, our current what? I, you broke up there for uh, a uh, one care. Would one care hmm. be able to put in an RFP? I would imagine so, but I think that we're uh, it's really premature to to think that far down the road. Cindy, I don't know what your thoughts are, but you know, again, the service coordination piece again was an idea that came from the providers, and so that's why it's in the RFI, but it's not. Um, predetermined that we'll, we'll go with that. Um, and it likely, you know, we could have proposals and uh, fund proposals from multiple entities. I don't think that we're, we're not looking for one statewide entity. Great. And then I guess a uh, follow up is that if it were not to be one care uh, to go with another vendor, um, would there be something within the RFP to determine how they would coordinate with one care and with um, the state, because that just seems like an additional entity within the sort of communication coordination uh, transparency. Yeah, I think that we would definitely want to coordinate with um, with one care. Thank you. And um, uh, go ahead, Madam Chair. You no, know, a follow up to to your question, Representative Whitman, um, and. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, you said that the idea um, of system coordination came from uh, the, the, the stakeholders, the people that you checked with. Um, so was the idea of the system coordination outs, um, outside of state government um, or a private entity, is that what came out of the stakeholder group? I'm going to um, defer defer to Cindy on that since she was part of the interviews. But I I think one thing to remember is that our current treatment system is they're all private providers, so it's not mm -hmm. like the state is is doing that work directly. But Cindy, go mm -hmm, ahead and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no, I think Kelly that, that what you said is is accurate. There there is no intention to have go outside um, to a different entity than we currently have. I'm not saying we wouldn't do it, but we don't. Ha that's not the plan. We have to wait to see what comes in from the RFI and and pull our stakeholders together and, and start the process. We really don't know what this is going to look like. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, um, Representative Whitman. Please continue. No, I, I suppose my uh, the next appropriate question would be: um, Will we get to see the RFI responses on April 29th? Mm -hmm. Sure, I don't see why not. Great. Yeah, Thank it you. will take. I, I do want to add. It will take us a while to, depending on how many we have. They're pre, it's a pretty lengthy RFI, so it'll take us a while to put the information together. But sometime after, that information is going to be shared. Well, yeah, people are very curious to see that. Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah. Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I'm curious. So the so the 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 RFI seems to be seeking, you know, potentially additional service providers as well as um, an entity or entities. Because I just heard you say that you're not necessarily committed to to one um, statewide entity um, that that manages or service delivery coordinator, as you refer to it. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to understand is wh like where do the resources come for that role of service delivery coordinator or coordinators um, in terms of the existing resources that the health department has. So um, I'm not aware of any additional appropriation. And so, you know, naturally I think service providers are thinking or may be thinking that the resources may be coming from uh, existing payments that are being made to service providers. So um, 
you have the opportunity to maybe dispel that or to, um, I, I'm just curious, where are the resources coming from if you end up with an RFP that, uh, you know, makes this, you know, significant delivery, service delivery change? Right. Well, I think that, remember, one of our goals is increased efficiency in the system. And so we imagine that there could be, you know, savings just from a lot of the administrative, you know, work that is happening now. Also, um, we, we, are, we will consider a value-based payment structure for our outpatient services. So um, there could certainly be savings to be gained from that. Um, if we move in that direction. And again, I'll ask Cindy if she has anything she wants to add to that. No, I, I think that it, our, we have no intention of reducing the no. funds to go to the providers. Okay, so um, if, you, if you're not gonna reduce the funds that go to providers and you mm -hmm. don't have an increase in appropriation, even if you do go to a value-based payment system, let's just say if you go to a value-based payment system that uh, if you're not gonna reduce funds to providers, that means that value-based payment system would utilize your existing resources. I, I'm unclear really about where you get the resources to, to um, you know, enter into you know, a, a contract or contracts you know, for the, uh, what looks like the management of the system. But, um, I understand that seems to be a misinterpretation. Right, uh, and you know, oh, go ahead, Cindy. No, I was just gonna say, th that's a really good question that we have ourselves. And um, we have not started at all to talk about payment of the system payment reform. We're not there yet. We are currently just gathering information about the system and how we could do better, how we could provide yeah. services that um, are as a, you know, meeting all the goals that we said. Down the road, we're going to start to talk about payment reform, but we're not there yet. So we we haven't addressed that. So um, we really don't we don't have the answers. Which um, is Representative okay, yeah. Wood and committee, um, we asked Diva to come in and um, uh, talk about the payment reform process, and we're told um, that they would not come in. Um, so. Um, uh, We'll either have them come in at another time or whatever, but that request was made and a decision was made either by the Commissioner of Health or by the Secretary that DIVA would not be coming in. Yeah, and I think that just to echo it. Yep. Go ahead, sorry. Madam Chair, um, wait just a minute, have a wait question. Dan, Dan, hold on. Oh. Um, I think Kelly wanted to say something. I was just gonna say, I, I just wanna echo what Cindy said. Um, that we're not looking at payment at this point. So I don't know if like Diva wouldn't really, I don't think at this stage would have much to, to contribute because we're really just looking at the delivery system at this point. Um, but eventually we would look at payment. Okay, um, Representative Noyes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do you know the percentage of individuals who seek sub, um, SUD, um, who are on Medicaid, receive their insurance through Medicaid? Do you have? I'm gonna ask Cindy to answer that one. I don't know that off the top of my head. We do have that. We'd have to get back to you on that. I don't have it off the top, but we do have the data on that. Okay. The number of Medicaid individuals who are seeking treatment, yes. Is Okay, thanks. Um, be interested to see that. I saw that you had uh, reached out to an FQHC and I know that they have um, a different billing rate with Medicaid. So um, just interested in what the percentage is. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, we can get back to you on that. I can respond to the FQHC is also an ADAP preferred provider. So we pay them the ADAP oh, rate. Cindy, so you've... Yeah. You, you've gone or else everybody has gone. No, I can hear. Um, Cindy, oh, can everyone else hear Cindy? Was it me who yes. just went? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, just, just to, to clarify for the FQHC, it's um, in Lamoille and they are an ADAP preferred provider. So their behavioral health services for substance use uh, is actually paid through ADAP with ADAP rates. It's not through the encounter rates. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, Representative Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Deputy Commissioner and, and Cynthia, forgive me because I can't help but think ahead, even though I know that we're waiting for the, the RFI results. Um, I do wanna say that the goals that you outlined, I, I really appreciate and I really um, support them and agree with them. And I love the fact that you're putting focus into this, but especially along the um, value-based system. Um, is that something that uh, you could conceive doing uh, in-house, I guess, within ADAP? And I guess with all of the goals as well, to what extent can you see, while we still don't know the responses of the RFI, um, but to what extent are you already doing some of this work within ADAP? And to what extent can you see um, the possibility of um, completing this work without an outside vendor? So um, we've already done some payment reform within ADAP for like our residential treatment programs, for example, and also with the hubs. So, um, you know, we have already undertaken some of that work. So I think it's, you know, something that we would be prepared to do. Cindy, any? No, I agree, Kelly. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our chair had a computer connection problem, so she is uh, logged off and is going to try to log back on. So just want to check in with members to see if there are further questions for these um, witnesses. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised. So I guess uh, Cindy and Kelly, you're off the hot seat for now. <laughs> um, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, you coming in and um, sharing the background, sharing, you know, the, as, as Representative Whitman said, the goals of what this process uh, is and, and, you know, frankly, putting a spotlight on it. We, we uh, appreciate the needs in the state and, um, while we might differ on the process to get there, I think the, the goals that you outlined are common goals for all of us. So um, thank you so much for being here. Um, okay. And um, there, I'm just sort of having to switch my screen. Our next, uh, our next witness is Chad Vigor. Is Chad, yes, I see you, Chad. Welcome. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Chad is the executive director of Recovery House and uh, welcome to the committee. And we appreciate um, any uh, thoughts that you might be able to provide on uh, what we're looking at in terms of this uh, system redesign for substance use disorders. Absolutely. <clears throat> and I thank uh, the representatives of this committee for inviting me today. Um, so just a little bit of background, if you're unfamiliar with Recovery House. Uh, Chad, we're an Chad, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. I should, have, I should have indicated, if you could just introduce yourself for the record, it's sort of a formality we have um, so yes. that people who are listening um, know who they're listening to. Uh, my name is Chad Vijay. I am the CEO of Recovery House Inc. Um, Recovery House uh, has multiple programs, uh, the Serenity House, Grace House, uh, we operate the public inebriate program out of Rutland and Addison County, and we operate a small office-based uh, MAT program. Um, we've been around for about 49 years, uh, so we've seen a lot of change, and, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss the changes that are uh, being considered by the state uh, in, in ADAP. Um, so again, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, I'm very much in line with the goals that this RFI is seeking to answer. The idea of uh, improving quality um, and the idea of addressing gaps that we have in our system of care. I, I think there are some gaps that need to be addressed, uh, certainly, but there are some concerns uh, specifically with the language of this RFI, uh, the, the idea of uh, uh, putting out uh, a request for information related to finding a service delivery coordinator. 
uh, and the key objectives being related to cost effectiveness. Um, our concern here is, is, is a large private entity going to come in, uh, offer a reduced cost uh, of providing this administrative work and, um, uh, and not have any connection to Vermonters. Uh, that, that's a concern that, that I have. And I know that uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, spoke about the idea that they're just considering options. Uh, but I, I think if, is, if it is an option to outsource that work, I, I think it would be um, appropriate to really consider what sort of ties the entity has to the state and the population that we serve. Um, in addition to that, the RFI indicates that you can apply to be both a service delivery coordinator and a service delivery provider. I think that opens the door for some potential conflicts of interest. Um, so I, I would like to see an entity that isn't providing any sort of service to the population. Um, that's just uh, uh, my, my thinking in that regard. And the other piece on the, the service delivery coordinator entity, um, I, I think it would be important to, uh, as the deputy commissioner pointed out, have some sort of community centric approach where uh, we need to recognize that the needs of, let's say, Rutland County are, are different than uh, the needs of Chittenden County. Um, and so having those individual relationships with uh, the area providers, I think, is critical. Um, Thinking about how this opens the door to uh, privatizing the work and, and bringing in larger entities, I, I think about the, the value-based payment uh, possibilities and, and uh, opening the door for providers to put up proposals to do service delivery. Are we opening the door to large national entities to come in and provide care to, uh, to our population? Uh, I think there's some thinking uh, on the national level that if you scale substance use treatment uh, and reduce overhead costs, uh, that it's more cost effective. Uh, but I, I think we run the risk of losing quality of care if we if we uh, if we leave that door open. Um, just some some thoughts that I have with that. Uh, Recovery House is also in an interesting position where uh, we are going through as a residential uh, entity, we're, we're in our uh, going into our third year of payment reform where we are receiving episodic rates versus uh, a daily uh, build rate. Um, so we're seeing the perspective of this value-based payment, um, but I'm also reading the language in the RFI that is cost effectiveness. Um, that to me, I, I think we need to address the idea that, uh, you know, we have to consider what cost effective and, and what, um, uh, what the costs are of treatment. Um, you know, thinking about workforce development in the addiction field, it, it's pretty frightening. Uh, the amount of people that uh, are in the fields, either aging out due to retirement, uh, and the lack of people interested in becoming licensed professionals. Um, I, I think we really need to focus on, um, you know, uh, providing appropriate wages. Uh, and and I, I thank uh, ADAP and, and Deputy Commissioner for pointing out that fact as well, that we have to uh, address the wage situation uh, within the field. Um, and so the question that I have in my work in responding to the RFI is, how can my agency be uh, in a spot where we work to control cost and not necessarily reduce costs to a point where we're unsustainable? Um, those are our primary concerns with the RFI. Um, and, and so that, uh, that was what I had. I'm wondering if anyone has any questions. Sorry, I was talking and I was muted. Thank you, Chad. And uh, my apologies for um, uh, mispronouncing your name so totally. <laughs> appreciate appreciate right. 
I appreciate uh, you saying it correctly. Um, are there questions for Chad with regard to his comments or any other thoughts that you might have committee members um, with regard to how that might intersect with the RFI as we see it? I have, I have a question uh, and then, uh, okay, Representative Whitman, go, uh, go ahead, then I'll ask my question. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And uh, Chad, uh, thank you for being here today. Um, my question is um, the idea of coordination within the rest of the system of care. Um, to what extent do you feel connected, coordinated within that kind of continuum um, in current state? And to what extent are you working with um, ADAP and kind of communicating within the larger system. You, to clarify, when you mentioned the larger system, are you speaking specifically about substance use or the healthcare system in general? I would, let's start with substance use. Okay. Uh, uh, so my organization uh, operates for anyone across the state. Uh, so I, I think we have a really good relationship with uh, all the providers and recovery centers around the state, and we're, we're open to furthering those relationships. Uh, so we're in a pretty good position there. And uh, as far as our relationship with ADAP, I, I've appreciated our relationship that we have with ADAP, um, whether it's the guidance on the administrative end or um, the, the guidance and recommendations that they put forth on uh, the, the quality end as well. Um, so that that is something that if, if the state decides to move in a direction where they outsource that coordination, you know, we'd have to rebuild a, a brand new relationship. Um, and I, I think we would lose something uh, that we've had with ADAP. Um, Thank you. Uh, and I guess a follow up for the next step is as far as co occurring, say, mental health um, concerns, uh, emergency room referrals, is that something that you have a lot of um, sort of lines of communication coordination currently? Uh, that's something that we're, we're improving as we speak. Uh, so the state issued the community action grants, the, the linkage to care grant specifically. Uh, here at Recovery House, we've, we've set aside some beds specific to uh, opioid overdoses. And, and so we're, we're generating this, this fast track from emergency room to Serenity House uh, through this grant and some case management efforts uh, in the hopes that folks will get transitioned to us the same day that they're at the hospital and stabilized, of course. Great, thank you. Well, um, Representative Bremstead. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And are you sure you don't wanna go with your question? I was gonna to wait to raise my hand so you would feel comfortable asking yours, cause I am- That's, a, that's okay, go, go ahead, I, I can stick mine in. Okay. <laughs> um, Chad, thank you so much for your testimony and for being here today. I, um, I'm just curious, what do you think about that? One of the things that ADAP um, told us at the very beginning is that it's really been 30 years since they've done any sort of redesign. And as someone who works in the field, is that concerning to you? And as you look at your colleagues, maybe in other states, do you see them delivering the care in a, in a way that would make you think maybe it's time for the health department to think about a redesign? That's a great question. Uh, I, I think if we're not constantly changing, we run the risk of being stagnant and I, I think quality of care decreases as a result. Um, the issue in looking outward is that um, I, I've been in this position for about a year now and what I'm seeing in other states is that there is a, a large swath of money makers in the addiction treatment field that is equally as concerning as you know uh, uh, anything that um, is out there. So uh, my concern is that you know if, if we change in the wrong direction and uh, it becomes uh, something more about money, um, you know that I, I think that will have unintended consequences uh, on the the quality of care. That being said, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that the cost for delivering treatment 
have increased. Uh, and, and that's something I, I think for future conversation within the legislation uh, in regards to appropriating more funds to substance use treatment specifically. So just one quick add on to that then, were you included in the discussion, the focus group discussions or were any of your colleagues included in that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, Cindy was the one who uh, interviewed uh, me. It was a really great conversation. You know, I, I am one of those who are excited about the idea of making positive change within our care system. Um, it, it just, I, I felt compelled to share the concerns of, you know, privatizing care. That's great. No, I, I'm I'm very supportive of hear, hearing that. I just wondered as I think big picture. So this is you, this has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Um, one of the things that I am uh, curious uh, about is the um, sort of this the coordination role that's um, that's being looked for in this RFI or inf you know information about possible aspects of that. And, and you spoke to coordination and, and the positive relationship that you've had with uh, ADAP uh, at the health department. So what do you, do you see, um, so that's coordination between you and the state. What do you see or do you see um, gaps in how to coordinate services, uh, you know, I'll say at, at the local level, you know, among different service providers who might have uh, different, uh, different might provide different services than you provide. So uh, I'm thinking about sort of like the web at the local level. Uh, how does that work for you now? And, and how do you feel like the system works now in that regard? I think that's one of the, the gaps that the state is looking to address. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in addressing that as well. Uh, the idea of linking people to care, you know, uh, treatment is accessible. But how do you get those who are in need to the treatment that they need? Uh, I know that we've increased our efforts around the state uh, to, to help out with that linkage. Um, and, and I think part of my idea of um, you know, having this service delivery coordinator um, interact really with specific areas uh, is you know, to, to address that, um, that idea that every area, every area's web is different um, and providers uh, interact differently. Um, I, I think it is something that we can improve on, the, the, the case management in between levels of care. Um, and and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, addressing that, certainly. Thank you. And I, I see Madam Chair is back, her internet problems. I don't know if they're solved, but at least temporarily she's back. So I will, uh, you're, you're muted, Madam Chair. Um, well, so I'm sort of back. I'll turn it back to you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, committee. Um, and I apologize to the deputy commissioner um, for needing to, well, I didn't need to, for being um, internet issues. Um, uh, Representative McFawn, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please excuse my lateness coming into the program. I too had computer problems yesterday and today. Um, but I know there's a guy out in the post over there and now I can see him. So that may be it. Um, happy St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day to everybody. I never would have known, Representative McFarland. I, I didn't think you would, but you have a nice, lovely green blouse on today. Mm -hmm. You're a very good Irish woman today. Um, I have one question. If something is working pretty well, and with some tweaking, it'll be much better, and you get that information from all the people in the field, um, my question is this. Um, why, uh, as part of this uh, RIP or whatever it's called, um, why is it on the table that um, this successful program uh, could be administered and operated by somebody outside of the state of Vermont or somebody other than who's operating it right now in the state of Vermont? 
because we're doing pretty well. I, I, I heard all kinds of allocates throughout the years about how well Vermont's doing. So why is that even on the table? That's my question. I guess from, that's for the uh, media uh, people, maybe. I don't okay. know. Okay, um, so um, Cynthia or Kelly, can you um, respond? Yeah, I can respond to that. So in some areas we are doing really well, you know, I would say, you know, the hub and spoke system is a model that, you know, has really been looked to nationally, mm -hmm. but we don't have um, a system that is as responsive to other substances of concern. And also, um, you know, like I said before, we're not looking for like a, a an outside entity per se to come in and and um, and take something over. You know, we would be working with our preferred provider system just like we do now. Um, so I think that there are areas for improvement. And um, Chad, I appreciate your um, acknowledgement that there are areas for growth. And I think that we should always be looking to for ways to make the system better for the people who who need it. And, and if I could follow up, Madam Chair, that, that's what I mean. You, you, you're asking for information from the field. You get that and you improve what you're doing now. Right. That, that's my question. Why do we, why are we even considering somebody else other than who's doing it? Why is We're that not. on the table? Yeah, I'm, I apologize. We are not considering someone else at this point. We're, we're not even there yet. We're, the purpose of the RFI is for anyone um, to submit ideas on what an improved system could look like. Uh, so that's the whole purpose is to collect information. We're not assuming that the people who are currently providing services are not gonna be providing services anymore. That's not the intent. Okay, good, thanks. Um, Representative Noyes, I'm not sure if your question um, is for Chad or for Kelly, but we're sort of having a round table discussion, I guess. Yeah, it may, it may um, span a couple people, but just um, in the presentation earlier, it said that 96% of the people don't seek treatment. Um, is your goal to get under the, you know, do you hope this change will um, get more people to seek treatment? And um, so that was like a pie chart that you presented earlier. So mm -hmm. um, I'll just let you answer that. Yeah, uh, well, I think that's one of our goals right now, even in our existing system, because we know that there are a lot of people who could benefit from treatment who aren't getting it. So we do an awful lot of outreach and marketing. Uh, we have our new Vermont help link, which the, you know, the goal of that was to make accessing treatment and other services um, more accessible. So I think that would continue to be a goal. I don't think it was the driving force, but it's, it's sort of an overarching goal that we're working toward all the time. And, and just to follow up, do you, um, do you have the capacity if more people were to come forward looking for help? Yes, I think that there is capacity in the system and, and we would ensure that everyone who wanted treatment would be able to get it. Just like we did with the hub and spoke, we expanded it as, as more people were looking for treatment, we worked to expand that system. And I think we would do the same for um, other outpatient services and residential. Um, Representative Noyes, if I might add to that, um, that's one place where the role of the legislature may in fact come into play because to expand the system, we're going to have to pay for it um, and that kind of thing. Um, committee, what I might, since our questions seem to be um, to many of the people who have spoken thus far, but we have not, um, 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 I believe we've not yet heard from, Mil from um, Melanie or Jack Duffy um, so why don't we hear from two other preferred providers and uh, then we can have um, more of a discussion um, because we are, um, and we have half an hour plus 
maybe close to 45 minutes. But um, so why don't we hear from um, Melanie, who's the executive director of the Clara Morton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee for inviting me uh, to speak today on behalf of uh, Vermont Care Partners, uh, which is made up of the 10 designated agencies and six specialized service agencies. Um, as you said, Madam Chair, um, my name is Melanie. I'm the executive director of Clara Martin Center. I also serve on the board of Central Vermont Substance Abuse Services in Berlin. Um, I've been the executive director for one year at Clara Martin Center, but I've worked here at the agency for 29 years in various different roles. My first 10 years was clinical work, and then my other 20 was in various management roles from HR director to operations to quality assurance. So my strength is in that aspect, and kind of this RFI touches on a lot of those different experiences that I've had in the field. Um, I come here as a representative of VCP of the designated agencies. So I'd like to just quickly touch and make sure I touch on the high points that we as a system wanted to acknowledge here. And then I'll speak on just a little personal um, experience uh, here at Clara Martin Center in rural Orange County. So I know time is of the essence. So uh, clearly Vermont Care Partners and our network agencies are committed to both mental health and substance use disorder treatment. Uh, we've been partners in the field for many years. Uh, as a network, we serve over 15,000 unduplicated uh, Vermonters in the last five years um, in our substance use disorder programs alone. 80% of our comprehensive service designated agencies are preferred providers, so uh, eight out of 10, uh, which is a third of all of the preferred providers in the state. And clearly the largest hub in the state, the Chittenden Clinic <coughs> is a Howard Center program. Um, there's a lot of data um, Julie Tesler has available for you if you are interested. Some of the key points we wanted to make um, is the ADAP system restructuring must be considered in the context of the larger health delivery reform taking place in Vermont. Clearly within the, the mental health uh, service system, we've been part of value-based payment reform and have had some success in that area. As providers of not only substance use disorders, but also mental health and developmental disability services, the VCP network believes that any restructuring of the SUD delivery system, including quality assurance, service expansion, uh, contracting and oversight must align with the internally coordinated with the rest of AHS, and especially with the efforts of Dale and DMH. I think one of the things we feel is that we have a strong working relationship with those state agencies and would love to build upon that and the structure that already exists to improve the care. And I think, you know, as a Vermonter, I appreciate kind of the opportunity to step back and look at our system and is there a way to do it better and appreciate ADAP's efforts around that. Um, but I think we speak of not wanting to reinvent a new system, but really work within the systems that we have and some of the strengths that we have. Clearly there's areas for improvement, um, but I think that that's something I'm passionate about and really work within our workforce um, and support our workforce that is so, they're treasures um, and we need to retain them at a time that we need them more than ever right now. And I worry about the instability of a major redesign at a time with COVID our numbers are just still going up. We haven't hit the peak, nor do we expect to hit the peak for some time. So I, just, I digressed a little bit, but a little personal um, worry thought um, as we discuss some of the changes here. Um, so clearly aligning with some of the other state agencies that rather than bifurcating the system, um, alignment would enhance opportunities of integrated and continuous care with people with really complex needs um, and those that have co-occurring mental health and other health conditions. Um, I think that's the other touch point that I personally just wanna speak, having been in the field for so many years, we've been working on the co-occurring model um, with ADAP, with SAMHSA for several years. And us here at Clara Martin Center really embrace this. Um, I don't think I can be a, an effective community mental health center if I don't provide substance use services and address the co-occurring needs of our populations. Um, so many people, whether they're personally dealing with a substance use disorder and actually meet a diagnostic, 
the family system and the community is impacting it, that you can't do this work without having a basic understanding of that. So building upon the integration, the co-occurring model is something that I've been passionate about. I think our organization has been passionate about that at a time that fiscally, you know, my CFO is relatively new to us. He's like, why do you do this? We lose money. But I can't do the work um, in a rural area where there aren't a lot of providers if I don't train my staff to have a basic level of understanding of substance use needs. Um, because, you know, it used to be it was a hot potato and you referred them out. I don't have that luxury. Let's, let's be comfortable and train, train my workforce so that we can handle this internally so that we don't get caught in the gaps um, where we lose people to services. I would also add with the value-based payment that we've been working on with, with mental health, I think it really does apply. Some of the same common measures um, apply to substance use services, you know, engaging them you know, within one to five days. We're working towards same day access and the engagement once they've been in the, in the, in the system. So uh, I, I got a little excited on a few of these bullets, but let me get back to some of the talking points. Um, you know, we have demonstrated, you know, the success at working with DIVA with payment reform, Dale and DMH and OneCare. So I know OneCare was a question um, that you folks had. Uh, so we have been um, trying to address the health of all Vermonters in those relationships. Um, we do have some concerns that ADEP had conversations with some individual stakeholders. The process did not involve system level planning and input and was not iterative where it built upon what other conversations were happening. Uh, the RFI indicates that ADEP is looking to bring treatment and recovery services under management by an outside entity at a time that there seems to be little appetite for state general fund dollar increases for the system. I know this was discussed about within this committee. And I think that that's a concern, I think, especially around the service delivery coordinator. You know, I think the service delivery services, we all are looking to do that better. Um, I think it, it made us nervous in terms of the coordinator role. And where does that money come from? Is that money going to come from care? As we talked about, there's no new monies into this system. So we share that concern that was discussed earlier. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think finally, I think you folks have a copy of this talking point. You know, we support, um, you know, no reduction in direct service dollars. Uh, we surely are focused currently on immediate access to care. Um, we surely are looking to build upon the peer recovery services available to support treatment programs. Uh, we do that both with substance use and mental health. Um, and that meaningful outcome measures align with outcomes in mental health and the general health care delivery reform process. Um, and finally, the intercept framework model, um, we look to encourage to continue with involvement with corrections where we're also involved with those folks. Um, so we've looked forward. I think uh, Cindy came to our VCP meeting recently and had a good conversation. Um, I think back in November, um, when we started these, hearing about these stakeholders meetings, I think we did get nervous and I think they've done a good job to try to um, kind of calm us down. Uh, they, they weren't looking to outsource to an external out of state provider to do some of what ADAP does um, and take those monies out of care. Um, I think my concern is we've seen sometimes that happen um, and once it gets too expensive, they leave um, and then we're left holding the bag and taking care of our Vermonters and making sure they don't fall through the cracks. So I think that's been my experience from a historical perspective that I worry about as I, as I listen to the, some of these concepts that are out there um, and uh, where reality is versus the process, you know, we'll see where this goes. Um, but uh, anyway, it's just interested in being part of that conversation. I think I touched on some of my uh, touch points locally here at the agency, um, but the workforce is something I absolutely just want to reinforce. You know, I am committed to taking care of my staff so they can take care of Vermonters at this time of great need. Um, and uh, anything I can do to provide them the stability, um, I want to do. Uh, we need them more than ever, and we are losing people in the field, whether it's compassion fatigue, retirements. Um, so that's just a plug I'd put in here um, that anything we do 
retains those workers and doesn't add new positions and takes away from, you know, we don't have a lot of um, trained workforce to uh, hire. So uh, I think you folks know that that's a barrier we, we face. So got a little excited there, um, but uh, you know, hopefully that uh, touches on kind of our perspective and where we sit right now. Um, and really just look to build upon some of the infrastructure we already have and build some of the strengths we have um, to address where we might um, need to improve. Sorry, Melanie, thank you. Um, and uh, committee, why don't we hold our questions or comments and let's hear from um, Jack D uh, Duffy, who's CFO of Valley Vista and then we can um, continue our discussion. Jack. Hi, so this is Kevin Hamill. I'm the vice oh. president of Valley Vista. I'm filling in for Jack today. Um, and I know uh, Rick DiStefano is also trying um, to log in right now because he wanted to address you, but since you're all waiting, I will step well, in um, here. Um, thank you. Is um, uh, we have we do not um, have people enter um, the committee room without knowing who they are. So there is a person who is trying to get in with no name, but with just a phone number. So um, if that is him, um, if you can, um, we have asked them to identify themselves. So please do you go ahead. Yep, and the number ending with 499, that would be Rick DiStefano, the owner of Valley Vista. Okay. Um, Looks like he was just let in. Okay. So who is testifying on behalf of Valley Vista? Uh, that's gonna be Rick DiStefano. Rick, please go ahead. Rick, you are um, you are muted. You are still muted, Rick. Madam Chair, could I add a note um, if Rick has not testified via phone today that it is a simple star six to unmute to participate via Zoom. Thank you. Rick, did you hear that? Star six will unmute you. Uh, they seem to still be muted. So um, and until I see the unmute and someone starts talking, um, let me open it up for um, more questions or um, comments. Um, Representative Gregoire, yeah. do, do you wanna jump in quickly? I can, so I can head in, I get an appointment here. Um, all I was going to say is what I said in the chat is that it sounds like um, I understand all the concerns, don't get me wrong, but you know, the RF, RF, RFI uh, process, I mean, to me is kind of like brainstorming. You're getting all your information and you're putting it on the table and you never start a brainstorming activity by saying, these are the things we can't do. You get everything on the table and then you go through them and say, why, why or why not they won't may not work. Um, but you never start a process like that by saying, we're definitely not looking at this option. Um, that's definitely not a good uh, brainstorming or uh, request for information type process. So I, it sounds to me like they're, they're moving ahead in a good direction. Uh, we'll get all the information and, and I'm sure they'll look and we'll look and, and all the stakeholders have a chance to look at what they found uh, and then go through and start saying, okay, well, this has some good components. This one we're kind of questionable about. Um, you know, et cetera. So that's, that's just my, my point. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Gregoire. And I understand you need to um, step away for a bit. 
I do. I will be back. Bye. <laughs> Good. Um, are there other um, questions? Now we have a um, we have both Kelly and Cynthia as well as um, Chad and um, I think we lost. Oh, and we do have Melanie. So we have other um, folks as well. Um, if no one has, uh, Kelly, this is um, maybe connected to um, the RFI or maybe it's connected to our current system. Um, unlike, um, unlike my understanding, and I could be wrong, Unlike the, the mental health system, unlike our physical health care system um, currently, currently the um, ADAP contracts and has as preferred providers um, um, an um, out of state um, for profit provider, and um, which is, I believe, a shift for the state of Vermont to. Um, contract with four providers for health care. Um, and how did we come into that? And um, is that something that is up for a question as to whether or not um, similar to other systems that we have that are um, nonprofits? Right. So, um, and I, I, Cindy will have more of the history of how those providers um, came into the state. But I can tell you that anybody who's in our preferred provider network, they are held to the same treatment standards um, as you know any other provider, and they're also paid the same way. So um, you know they're they're not being treated any differently than um, than the other providers. But Cindy can speak to how um, some of those entities, uh, what the process was when they came into the state, since that was before my time. Am I off mute? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think our first was that um, when, and that was put out to bid, I believe, again, this was before my time. I was working in the state, but not in ADAP. And then BART um, Behavioral Health, who runs a number of our hubs, they it was through an RFP. So we did RFP the hub services and they won the contract. The last hub we opened was up in St. Albans and it went the same process. We put it on an RFP and they were chosen as the entity. Um, Habit Opco, same thing. They It was for a hub through an RFP. Okay, thank you. Thank no. you. Um, I see that um, Rick from Valley Vista has, has come back on and I think we'll be able to hear you. And so uh, Rick, thank you very much. Um, please go ahead and. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good to be heard. So sorry, I was trying to press pound six for ever it didn't work. I just hung up and dialed back in. It seemed to work. So uh, first I heard about Jack Duffy was gonna join this call was a bit more prepared for this. Uh, he had an unexpected uh, emergency come up and was not able to do it. Called me and asked me if I would jump on. Happy to do so. Um, you know, basically, I think that o overall, uh, this group uh, probably knows that uh, Jack and I were the uh, initial uh, folks at Valley Vista beginning services in 2004. We sold the company 2017 um, after some difficulties with the owners that bought uh, Valley Vista Meridian Behavioral Health. We had some communications with the health department, Cindy, others, and uh, we ended up buying the company back in May of last year. So we've been operating less than a year at this point uh, mm -hmm. through obviously a very difficult year with with COVID. Uh, you know, we had a lot of years of experience prior to that. Uh, and are glad to be back. And I think that we came back to a facility that was in very tough shape staffing wise. Um, certainly COVID had taken its toll, but uh, the company was uh, already in, uh, was not doing a very good job in my opinion, looking back on what they were doing, running the company. And uh, 
we kind of felt this really was our legacy. We started the company in uh, 2004 and wanted to come back and bring Valley Vista back to the quality program that we believe it was when we left in 2017. So for that, I apologize. We think we sold the company to some good people who were all fired about six months later. It was uh, basically a, a financial decision. They were being funded by uh, uh, a group that decided that they weren't performing well enough from a financial standpoint and pretty well cut them off. And they did a lot of what I would call damage to the quality of programming that was being offered at Valley Vista at the time. And I know that I think the health department folks would agree with that. And uh, we're back on track now. It's been a tough, tough time trying to rebuild. Um, many of our uh, licensed staff members left. Um, we lost uh, uh, almost all of our managers. Uh, fortunately, we were able to bring back our CFO and a few other folks uh, that, that did stay on. Uh, Kevin Hamill, who's been on this call, is uh, overseeing the clinical nursing and, and medical program. Uh, Kevin's a registered nurse with 20 plus years of experience. Uh, myself and Jack are regularly at the facility and, and trying to make some, some good changes in a rather tough world. And, and I guess that, uh, you know, just quickly, uh, you know, we, we ended up, uh, you know, with a very, very poor census when we started. Uh, we have 99 beds total between Virgins and Bradford. Um, we have a 19 bed women's facility in Virgins. We have 80 licensed beds in Bradford. Uh, about 20 of those are women's beds. The remaining beds are male beds. Uh, Meridian gave up the adolescent unit while we were away. Uh, so there is currently not an adolescent unit there. The census was in the 20s when we returned. Uh, we've been averaging about 50 to 55. Now it's been difficult to bring patients in in this environment. Uh, we also had about a COVID in the building in November, uh, which reduced our census to four. Uh, we were not able to admit for 17 days. We had nine positive cases of COVID amongst our staff. None uh, were involving our patients, fortunately. Um, we've been helped out uh, in, in a very nice way by the health department and testing and uh, so far so good. We've done a pretty good job keeping COVID out of the building. We're testing every patient before coming if they've not already been COVID tested. Our census is about 50% uh, occupancy, as I say. Uh, we're admitting about 100 to 120 people a month right now. Um, and it's been very, very difficult to maintain financially with that kind of a census. Uh, fortunately, the assistance money from the state, the federal monies and some PPP money has allowed us to keep the doors open. Uh, we're trying to navigate and get used to the uh, new payer system, which is an episodic care right now, which is something Jack and I were certainly not used to. We were at a per diem rate always. Um, we're finding it very difficult with the rents we have to pay for these buildings uh, to be able to maintain and quite frankly are very concerned when any kind of relief money uh, is ended, whether or not, uh, you know, just on census alone, 50 patients will not pay the bills at Valley Vista and keep it operating. So we're very concerned about that and certainly have been talking to the health department and Medicaid about some payment reform issues. We really believe that without some major changes, it'll be very difficult to keep these 99 beds or operational uh, going forward if uh, funding uh, from the federal and state uh, were not to be uh, available to us in the future. I mean, um, I, I guess that, uh, you know, right now our mix is um, about 80% uh, Vermont Medicaid patients. Um, we do have uh, uh, other uh, third party insured patients in the building. Um, we are trying to grow that census. That certainly helps because we're being paid about twice the rate from the third party insurance as we are from Vermont Medicaid. We also have contracts with uh, a couple of the managed care companies in New York State, uh, namely Fidelis and CDPHP. And we're being paid about 40% higher rates from out of state Medicaid than we are Vermont Medicaid. So growing some of that business certainly will help us keep the doors open going down the road. One of the things that we're really very concerned about right now is that we have um, we have very difficult patients trying to come into Valley Vista, especially since the uh, void with uh, Brattleboro kind of ending their detox services December 31st. We're seeing many, many more requests for patients who are too psychiatrically impaired for Valley Vista, but no other place to go. They don't qualify to get into a uh, uh, mental health facility. Uh, they're not sick enough for them, but many of them are too sick for us. 
we try to admit as many of those as we can. Uh, we find out that we, um, you know, are successful with some and some we need to discharge, but once they're there, it's extremely difficult to discharge them to a uh, inpatient uh, psychiatric facility. And uh, uh, that's, that's a real big concern of ours right now is a lack of, of services to, to move people to a higher level of care when they need that. Uh, really, really difficult uh, without uh, the Brattleboro Retreat being able to uh, accommodate the detox needs of the patients coming coming through the door, continuing need for detox services. Uh, that's certainly been a big big problem for us. Um, we um, we're also finding that uh, right now uh, to operate these facilities compared to when Jack and I were here for the uh, 14 years, um, nursing costs have skyrocketed for us. Um, we can't find nurses in the state of Vermont. Um, the pay, if we do find them, has gone up about 30%. So we're having to staff with temporary nursing, uh, agency nursing at the rate of 100 plus an hour, uh, guaranteeing them 48 hours a week. We're talking about uh, nursing costs right now for uh, three uh, nurses right now in the building that are traveling nurses is just about our entire nursing budget. So that's something that we really see as a threat to our continued existence going down the road. Um, and the other issue is the uh, recruitment and hiring of LADCs, licensed alcohol drug counselors, which really right now is just about, uh, there's just no one out there. And we're, we're, we're increasing the amount of pay. Uh, certainly what we see has happened and certainly a great thing for the state of Vermont, the blueprint, but the blueprint has changed the rate of pay for LADCs, has increased the rate of pay substantially for LADCs. And we're having a really difficult time competing with the Monday through Friday schedule of a blueprint uh, uh, of counselor in, in, in the MAT program uh, or hub. And it's, um, you know, our, our, our operation is 24 seven and it's made it extremely difficult for us to, uh, to hire and um, bring staff in. We're trying to do what we did in the past, train our own, but we're uh, certainly lacking in licensed alcohol drug counselors or licensed mental health professionals. We're also finding that the amount of psychiatry we need in our buildings right now uh, with the difficult patient population that we're taking in is not something that we feel is in the current rate, the episodic care rate. And um, to afford psychiatry, the amount of psychiatry we need in the building, um, we certainly know that we'll be struggling down the road uh, with, with, uh, with that being able to happen. Uh, we do have some psychiatry now. We're trying to recruit more psychiatry. Um, the, the reality is, is that our patients require a fair amount of psychiatry, a fair amount of medical co-occurring issues as well. We do have a full-time uh, family practice nurse who is um, who is seeing most of our um, most of our regular you know, sick call type or medical issues in the building. We have a medical director who is a internal medicine doc by training and uh, addictionologist for the last 25 years, uh, certified addictionologist, board certified. Um, and we are able to take care of the majority of the medical uh, uh, issues going on the building at a, at, a, at a fair expense as well. So I guess what I just said is that, you know, we have some major concerns with uh, the number of co-occurring mental health and, uh, and, and our substance abuse population and uh, the dollars associated with nursing, with LADCs, with mental health professionals, with um, psychiatric staff is really uh, is really something that we really feel needs to be addressed for us in the really near future for us to continue to exist when some of the relief monies go away. Rick, um, thank you. Thank you very much for one, filling us in and talking about sort of the history of of where Valley Vista is now and some of the um, struggles and how you um, are addressing them and how you um, bought back the, um, the, the, the company in order to, um, to bring it back to where it was. Um, and for um, part of what we are trying to um, understand better now uh, today is um, the direction or the um, uh, request for information um, in terms of system redesign that the uh, 
department um, that ADAP is is engaged in. Um, were you um, part, did you or anyone in your staff participate in any of those um, focus groups or um, stuff that that they had done in the feedback? We did not. I'm not sure if Kevin was on any of those calls, but uh, I did not participate. Jack uh, has had some participation and okay. has reviewed much more of that than I have as okay. the executive director in the building. Yep. And thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, committee, uh, do you have um, any questions for um, Rick in terms of Valley Vista? or um, Chad um, in terms of recovery or um, or Melanie or for that matter for um, uh, uh, Kelly or um, Cindy as it relates to ADAP. I mean I think this is our opportunity. Um, Representative Whitman and then Representative Noyes. Thank you Madam Chair. Um, one of the uh, themes I've been thinking about is the uh, substance agnostic uh, system, um, especially looking at the um, sort of um, a claim that the hub and spoke model has gotten while being opioid specific and some of the numbers that Kelly introduced about alcohol use being another big uh, concern. So a bit of a naive question, um, what is a kind of inpatient uh, equivalent to uh, medically assisted treatment for people uh, with alcohol uh, substance use disorder. And to what extent do different organizations, uh, Rick, Chad, Melanie, um, feel that they have the capacity to be substance agnostic, uh, be able to meet different people's needs based on the substance? Well, from the point of view of Valley Vista, I will tell you that, that uh, you know, as, as much as we see opioid use disorder being, you know, a big, big part of what we do, um, you know, we're, we're still treating alcoholism, uh, detoxing for alcohol, um, and are able to accommodate the needs of, of uh, any, any drug. Um, we we're seeing all kinds of different substance use out there. And, uh, but, but, but still, um, you know, the uh, patient who's admitted for uh, alcoholism, alcohol detox is still a regular patient and a regular part of what we do at Valley Vista. Thank you. Um, Chad, you wanted to add to that? Uh, yes. Uh, similar to Valley Vista, we offer alcohol detoxification. Uh, and, and I would say that we are absolutely substance agnostic, uh, whether it's alcohol, cocaine, uh, opioids, uh, amphetamines, whatever it might be, uh, we're certainly there providing treatment. As far as the MAT side of things, uh, we are linking folks to, uh, you know, some medication options for alcohol, you know, continued uh, medication options, whether it's naltrexone, Vivitrol, uh, antabuse, and, and so forth, um, and, as well as linking folks to the opioid side of MAT as well. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. Representative Noyes, you, oh, sorry, Melanie, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would just concur with that, Representative Whitman, um, that we do offer the full continuum regardless of substance, um, whether it be mat, uh, alcohol, smoking cessation. Um, it's probably just the different hot levels of care, um, but the substance itself we can treat. Great. Thank you all. Um, Representative Noyes. Um, Representative Noyes, are you having internet problems? Am I the only one that sees him as stuck? Oh, are you back? He's Rep back. You're back, Representative oh. Noyes. You were you were stuck. For sorry a while. about that. Little uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, hey, I just had a quick question. Um, what is the average length of stay inpatient? Um, if someone were to go to Valley Vista, uh, Valley Vista. Um, I've seen, is the average list, um, Rick? Could you answer that in terms of? Yep. Yeah, I'm happy to. 
Um, average length of stay at uh, Valley Vista would probably be a 14 to 17 day length of stay. Um, and, and, you know, obviously not every patient uh, stays uh, for the time we want them to stay. We do have a rate of about 18 uh, percent against medical advice uh, discharges, uh, occasional administ administrative discharge. But uh, two to three weeks uh, would, be, would be the average length of stay. 14 to 17 is probably what most patients end up staying. And what does that cost? Cost, or what are we reimbursed for that? No, oh, reimbursed. Time. Thank you. <laughs> well, our, our good point. Re reimbursement rates. I, I don't have those various buckets in front of us, but in the episodic care rate currently, there are qualifiers for different uh, different uh, uh, rates. So, so we're reimbursed as as, as little as um, a little over three thousand dollars for some of those patients, and then some of those who meet some of the criteria around homelessness, around co-occurring issues, medical uh, issues and whatever, uh, that rate could, could, could go up by several hundred dollars. But uh, probably I would say if, if we looked at it overall, Jenny, you might have a better feel for that if you're on, but it's somewhere in the low to mid threes for that entire stay. So if we average um, out the month. length of stay, I'm sorry, this is Jenny uh, Gilman. I'm VP for Valley Vista Finance. Um, our average daily stay is about 226 for a Medicaid patient. That's what the average, um, it averages out to be daily. Right, right. Obviously it does not cover costs. Yeah, it's, not, it's currently not covering costs of Valley Vista, that's, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I wanna ask um, Cindy or Kelly, if you have any final comment you'd like to leave us with today. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for your time and for inviting us. I think that, um, you know, as with everyone, we've we've been a little uh, focused on COVID, and it's really great to be able to um, come and talk with you about this really important work. And um, we'll certainly keep you updated as the results or the responses to the RFI come in and we'll um, be sharing those with you. And um, if we can come back for a follow-up at some point, we're more than happy to do that. So thank you. Well, and thank you very much for that offer. Um, and um, if we forget to ask you, and you think we should have, because you're doing things that um, are exciting or new or whatever, please, um, please invite yourself <laughs> and say, you know, we have something to share. Um, we certainly will. Thank you. Um, um, Rick or Melanie or Chad, do you have any final comment you want to leave us with for today? I would just like to thank you as well, and Kelly and Cindy as well, for participating in this important conversation about a uh, important need for our, our communities um, and that uh, we provide, provide good care um, most effectively, most efficiently. And uh, so I appreciate ADAP and this committee's uh, support to looking at this on behalf of Vermonters. Um, and th thank you. And I guess I want to um, uh, thank all of you who have participated because I think you have helped me at least. And I think the committee to maybe understand what the purpose of the RFI is. It's not really what the understanding is in the community. And if there's any undercurrent of what the community had understood that is the unstated um, um, expectation, to have heard our concerns um, and our questions about that. Um, so thank you, thank you all very much for that. Um, and committee, I would um, suggest that we take a 15 minute break um, until, and we're going to change subjects at 11.15. Um, so um, thank you all very much.